This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick, and now, Radio Joe Hughes. All right, good day, wherever you're listening from, and welcome, it's IAQ Radio. Uh, This week, we're going to have part two of our discussion about electricity, EMFs, and IEQ with Sal LaDuca. Sal should be joining us here any moment, and uh, we're going to follow up on, you know, a real nice job he did on part one. In part one, we kind of went through the, from the generating facility to the wires in the home. For part two, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the terminal unit kind of things, you know, like the... Um, cell phones and routers, etc. We'll start with that. And then we're going to go into a lot of detail on how to investigate for electricity, electromagnetic fields, harmonics, etc. So before we get started, let's thank our marquee sponsors. IAQ Radio marquee sponsors are John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at IAQ.net. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Victor Cafaro, Richmond, Virginia, for being first to identify the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale as the intensity rating on which hurricanes are rated. The IQ radio trivia question for today, Friday, February 23rd, 2018, has been sponsored by Ideas, the solution chemistry company, creating unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here is today's trivia question. The reliability and precision of an ordinary mechanical watch can be affected by magnetic fields. Legendary Swiss watchmaker Rolex developed a special watch model that is resistant to magnetic fields. Name it. Back to you, Joe. All right. Thank you, Cliff. So Sal Laduca is an environmental consultant. He specializes in the built environment. He's got over 40 years of experience in instrumentation and controls. He started out as a nuclear reactor operator and a reactor technician on the USS Mississippi. After discharge, he was offered employment by Jersey Central Power and Light to help build a radiological survey instrument repair facility at their Oyster Creek nuclear power plant. And from there, he migrated to communications department where he performed installation, calibration, and repair of various generators or generations of remote controlled supervisory equipment for the power system control. In 1994, he began offering electromagnetic field services to clients. In 1999, he acquired some additional training with the Institute of Building Biology and Ecology and expanded his services to include indoor air quality. And since then, he's added some IAQA, uh, ACAC, ACAC certifications Most importantly, he's got a lot of real-world experience in residential, commercial, and industrial projects, and I I really like the way Sal takes a very practical approach to the topic. Anyway, Sal, great to have you back. Um, Let's let's go back to part one for just a moment um, and and kind of, you know, we we did a nice job of going from the power plant to the home, and then um, we talked about the wiring in the home a little bit. We didn't get into a lot of detail on assessment of it, but we'll do that today. Um, one of the things we didn't really get a chance to talk about, and I, I want you to maybe kind of go over for listeners, is the type of exposure people get from things like their cell phone or from a router in their home uh, and other, 
I'm going to call them terminal units for lack of a better term, you know, things that plug into the wall, your lamp, your uh, mechanical system, your, your computer, etc. Can you talk to listeners a little bit about the type of exposure they get from that and, and in your experience, how big of an issue that is? Um, generally, there are three types of exposure and their interactions are different. Uh, from each other. One is a, an electric field exposure from anything that's energized. So if you have a desk lamp by you, the power cord is energized, it's emitting electric fields. Um, there are magnetic fields that occur because of current flow, and generally in a power cord like that desk lamp, supply and return are next to each other in the same cord, the magnetic fields from the respective currents overlap and cancel out, so there's no magnetic fields. So you should normally not experience magnetic fields in a home unless you're near a device like a blender or washing machine or whatnot. Um, if you have wiring issues, then that can come into play. If there's a power line in the neighborhood, that can come into play. Uh, so those are electric and magnetic type exposures. Um, the interaction, as I said, are different. Then there is radio frequency, and that also is different, and that varies depending on the intensity, the type of modulation, whether it is a constant wave like uh, AM or FM radio, perhaps, uh, or whether it is pulsed uh, type energy like a router or a cell phone. Um, and generally, the radio frequency exposure is more of a vibrational type of exposure where your internals, your molecular structure, gets vibrated to a certain extent to make something happen. Hmm. What about the, the recent stuff we've seen on cell phones? And um, I guess in California, they put a warning out for people that, you know, using a cell phone too often, too too close to your ear, may have some health effects. Um, then there was some other information that came out that seemed to kind of counter that. I wonder if you could just talk to listeners for just a moment about cell phone usage and maybe give us some tips on, you know, I just try not to use mine as much. Um, when I'm in, in the office, I use my landline as much as possible. Uh, I, I, I ask people to call me on my office line as opposed to always directly going to the cell phone. Is that something that you would recommend? That is absolutely something I would recommend. For one, the voice quality on a landline, and I mean a solid copper line to your local phone company, is better quality than anything you can get on cellular services. Um, and when you consider cellular exposure, let me ask you a silly question. Have you read your user manual for your cell phone? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, no. if, you, if you were to go look, somewhere <laughs> in the back, after page 172 or whatnot, in the bottom of the page is probably a silly little statement that says, do not hold the cell phone in contact with your ear. Well, excuse me, but isn't that the way you use a phone? That's, yeah, the last so, I that's how they're used most of the time. But they don't really tell you what the ramifications are of holding a cell phone next to your ear. For that, you have to go to the research and then the... The uh, business interest research that tries to counter that. So you have academic research of people who are trying to figure out why is this happening to certain people and why is this number of certain people increasing? And then you have the people with interest that say, no, 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 nothing is happening. There's no coincidence. Oh, so I, I have a follow up. Yes, please. You know, if you're wearing a cell phone, um, you know, sometimes you see people that walk around and they have actually, uh, you know, one plugged into their ear, you know, that has the speaker and, and so on and so forth. Other times they have a, a standard cell phone and they end up using buds or something like that, you know, to, uh, to, to listen. Uh, are any of those safer than the others or do they all have different inherent risks? Well, Everything can have a certain risk when you're talking about cell phones and you talk about a cell phone that is connected to the mothership. 
you are producing radio frequencies that travel in free space, that travel into anything conductive like your body, and that travel into anything conductive like the wires to your headphones. And as an aside to wearing headphones, even that carries a risk. You may think this is somewhat rare, but I've read of at least two or three incidents where people were um, out in the woods and they got struck by lightning were wearing um, these headphones and in one the wire was scorched to the extent of basically tattooing it into the person's chest and in the other case it exploded the guy's eardrums and so you have to think well you know it's cute that's not going to happen to me until it may happen mm. so when you look at cell phones there are some headsets that have a simple air tube and that eliminates the conductivity of the physical wire. So in that respect, that would eliminate the radio frequency coupling directly through the wire. But the best way to use a cell phone, if you have to use one, to me would be in a speaker phone mode where it's sitting on a desk or a windowsill or whatever, the dashboard of your car, as long as you're not moving with that car uh, and use it as long as uh, you need to, and only as long as you need to. Thank okay. you. I like that. That's good, good advice. All right. Let's, look, we're going to slide over now so, to um, the, the PowerPoint we put together for today, and you, you put together. You sent me the information. I have my girls put it into a little PowerPoint here. Uh, let's go to the first slide. I want to talk a little bit about field de detection and measurement. Um, let's Let's – Tell listeners a little bit about this slide. I think it's a good overview to help us with uh, setting the, the background, the, the basics for the rest of the conversation today. Okay. Um, I get a regular number of calls, possibly maybe 20%, 30%, where a potential client calls me up and says, I just bought a meter and I read two on it. So I got two of something, and is that bad, and how do I fix it? Hmm. Well, there's been so much um, discovery in working with magnetic fields, and because they are so much easier to measure, it's typical for somebody to get a meter that can read magnetic fields, and so they think that that is all there is. In reality, you need to look at the various different aspects of EMFs, and you need to try to figure out whether you want a lot of detail or whether you want just enough detail to fix the problem and get on with life. When you look at the graph that we have here, you can look at something in the way of, let's say we have a field. We can look at whether that field has characteristics, whether it's a motor with brushes that would tend to introduce all kinds of frequencies in addition to the fundamental of 60 hertz. And so you consider the waveform, you consider the uh, harmonics, which have different interactions with us. Um, and as in the one case I may have mentioned that you may have put in it a PowerPoint, I went to a client's home because they had a meter, they had a field when the HVAC unit came on. And so with the similar meter, I verified that that was indeed the case. Then with another instrument, I went along and measured current, and I measured the current on the cable feeding the HVAC, and I knew that that was incorrect. So the technician showed up, and I showed him what to test for, how to test for it, and they replaced an outlet for the condensate pump and fixed the problem. It was that simple, two simple measurements. Or you could go into detail and look at all the various uh, aspects of the EMS. But again, that's given time, uh, resources, luxury, which is not always available with many clients. Let's talk about those two measurements you, you made. Um, that, I think that's a really good project to kind of give people a visualization. So you go in, um, what was, first of all, the homeowner measuring and with what instrument? The homeowner was measuring a magnetic field um, something possibly like this instrument, uh, which is a, which is a three coil or three axis Gauss meter. And they were able to determine that they had a magnetic field 
in the bedroom, which was somewhere 20 to 30 feet away from the HVAC. And so they realized, okay, this should not be happening. So with a similar instrument, I walked around the home and realized that, okay, the pattern is all over the place, telling me that there's current going to this device and the return is scattering everywhere. And as it turned out, the three amps that was feeding the blower motor was going right to the frame and then scattering to everything metallic through the um, air ducts, through the gas piping, through everything metallic through the rest of the house, which could have also been a shock hazard if somebody doing mechanical work. Um, and then with a separate meter, which was a clamp on current, current probe, I was able to clamp on to the feed to the HVAC and determined that there was current um, in the unit and the current should never be detectable in that if the supply and return currents are identical, I should always read zero on that feed. Mm -hmm. And so I verified with two separate instruments with two also very basic measurements that there was a problem. It was associated with the device and I was not really the guy that had all the spare parts. So the HVAC technicians showed up. They had a variety of spare parts on their uh, vehicle. And with it, they exchanged parts and made the problem go away. Great. I think that's a really good visualization of, of what we're talking about here. Let's go to the next slide, John. So we're, we're talking a little bit about field detection and measurement. Um, EMF measurement is similar to – this was a little background you and I talked about before the show. Can you kind of tell people a little bit about how EMF measurement – because a lot of our listeners are indoor environmental professionals. They do all kinds of measurement. How is it similar to – IAQ particulate measurement, and, and where does it differentiate? Well, when you go into a home and you're concerned about the environment and you're looking at IAQ specifically, you may be tempted to take an air sample. And if you take something like uh, a uh, particle uh, capture cartridge like Zephon or uh, something else, you're going to end up getting some numbers, but those numbers are based on the particle size. They're based on the velocity going through the uh, cartridge. So there are various technical little side lights that you may not even consider when you're actually taking a sample. So when you think about even just the particulates, we have the issues that come into play that are the size of the particulate, the geometry of the particulate, how many there are, how abundantly they are over time, whether they're constant or intermittently showing up. In similar respects, we have EMF measurements that can be electric fields constant most of the time, magnetic fields that happen intermittently depending on what is turned on, if there are wiring issues, um, harmonics depending on what type of device that you have that is actually using power, and then we have the ubiquitous anymore radio frequency, where you have routers, cell phones, computers, and everything trying to do things by magic, as it were. So let me, let me break this back down one more time for listeners. We've got electric fields, magnetic fields, harmonics, and radio frequencies. Those are the, the four foundations, I think, um, that we want to establish at this point. Would you agree? Yes, I agree. All right. Now, let's. I think we've done a pretty good job of talking about the electric fields and the magnetic fields, but um, let's review quickly for listeners harmonics and, and what harmonics is and, and how that comes into play when you're doing an investigation for uh, this type of issue. Harmonics are what you might say – are higher frequency echoes of the input power frequency. So if you start out with 60 cycles here, 50 hertz anywhere outside of North America, you're gonna end up having multiples of 60 or 50 hertz, and generally only the odd harmonics show up. So what will happen is depending on the type of device and how many of those devices you have, you will have these harmonics showing up that can be biologically irritating. 
that can complement the electric and magnetic fields wherever it is that they happen. Uh, generally, when you think of harmonic sources, you need to consider fluorescent lighting first, whether they are um, compact fluorescent, whether they are in a loop, whether they are in a straight line, anything fluorescent will do that because it uses AC power in a non-smooth fashion. Uh, dimmer switches do the same thing. Um, LED lighting do the same thing in not as an intense fashion because they use less current. And also digital devices, computers, um, cell phones, anything that you have plugged in that is using power in a non-smooth fashion is going to produce harmonics. Okay, we've got the, the slide up here. Sal, the waveform and harmonics measurement provide clues as to what piece of equipment is, is involved. And how do you measure the harmonics? Well, with the harmonics, you would need a power quality meter um, among the tools that you could possibly use. And that is something that lets you look at the uh, waveform of whatever signal you're trying to measure it would provide you a frequency spectrum and a display of those frequencies that are occurring. And it would tell you their intensity relative to something else. For a power quality meter, it would be their intensity or their height relative to the 60 hertz, 120 volts. And so that you would need a specialized instrument. We're going to show an example of that in a little bit, but let's let's back up for just a minute. Let's go to the next slide, John. So as we go through the field detection and measurement discussion, uh, you mentioned here that problems can emerge from the type of wiring employed, any wiring errors present, nearby power lines. I think we've covered that fairly well. Now, okay. the, the cause and intensity or relevance is what makes that assessment valuable uh, yeah. because you can know what to do about the concern, if anything. Do you want to expand on that just a bit? Well, let me give you a case history in that I was asked to go to a home and identify issues they were having with radio frequencies, interference, and whatnot. And they had incandescent lighting throughout, which was a good thing, but they had dimmer switches in every room in the house. And as I recall, when I was there, they had maybe 10 of these in use. So I'm trying to detect harmonics and they're very intense. And so I decided to use a radio frequency meter because when the harmonics are intense enough, they increase in frequency span up the spectrum into the radio frequency region. And as I'm measuring in the home and I'm turning around, I'm detecting the same intensity everywhere about me as if I was inside of the radio frequency source. Hmm. I concluded that the dimmer switches and their number all around me were producing this background. And I said to the client, I said, look, there's only so much I can do because of these devices. Would you please have them removed? And then I'll come back and measure again. And with this client, I was given that luxury. I came back three months later and measuring with that radio frequency probe. Again, now I did not detect radio frequency except in some very small spots in the house based on the one router that they had. So the problem, the radio frequency presence was because of the dimmers causing extensive harmonics that were very intense and spanning high up into the frequency spectrum. Hmm. Interesting. Let's go to the next slide, John. So let's talk a little bit. The first check you talk about during a generic EMF visit, you're going to check for electric fields. Here's your first piece of equipment, your basic non-contact voltage probe. Can okay. you tell us a little bit more about that? That voltage probe is sensitive enough to detect low voltage systems like 12 volt systems for lighting and control. And with it, I can approach a wall of a home and within two feet or so, I start detecting an electric field if there is Romex wiring which is typical in North America, 80 or 90% of homes. If on the other hand, they have armored wiring, which may look something like this with a flexible armor around the cable, 
yes. then the electric field emission will be reduced by 99%. Wow. So when I use that non-contact voltage probe, if I get an immediate response on approach to the wall, I know what kind of wiring there is. Okay. Based on that alone, now I can start summarizing things quickly and thinking, okay, there is an electric field ambiance everywhere in the home because of type of wire. That's biological irritant number one. If there are additional issues like harmonics on top of that, they complicate the matter. So, so that's that first check, which may last 20 or 30 seconds, is sufficient enough for me to get an idea of globally what's happening in the home. Okay. That's like your background measurement, basically? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next slide there, John. So here, here we say some investigators use an E-field meter, um, which is around $2,000, I guess, to perform the same basic function. Uh, you say you just can't justify it because the E-field will, level will vary inch by inch. I'm not tell you what the cause is or the polarities involved, which are very relevant. I think that's an important slide for people doing investigations. So someone as experienced as you, going out and doing many of these over many years, you, you don't necessarily see the uh, need for the E-field meter. Can you expand on that a little bit? If you were to look at the inside of a breaker panel, you would realize that there are two sources of 120 volts in a home. And these have opposite polarity relative to each other. So depending on whether you are in a room near the breaker panel, where there may be a couple of dozen cables going through the floor, the walls, and the ceiling to other parts of the home, or whether you are in the most distant room from that panel where there's only maybe one or two cables, the electric field can vary dramatically in the two rooms, whereas in the room farthest away from the panel, there may be only two cables and you can easily tell what's going on, whereas in the room by the panel, you have all these sources scattered about different polarities, and as you move the meter, even a few inches, that field level will vary, and it really doesn't tell you what's going on. With that, with that non-contact voltage probe, I identify that there is an electric field, and if we want to find out what the sources are and how relevant they are, then we can look at what breakers actually feed that room, how many cables go past that room to serve other areas in the home, and that's why I, I cannot justify the standalone electric field meter because it doesn't give me the information that really I can work with. It's wonderful, but $2,000 for just an instrument that's on a shelf? Uh, yeah, yeah. Difficult. But now let me ask this, then we're going to go to halftime. Just want to alert listeners and, and Cliff, uh, we'll go to halftime after this question. You're an experienced guy. You, you've been doing this for many years. You can look at that and, and maybe have a better idea what's going on, what's going on without the use of the E-field meter. If, if you had someone that was less experienced, do you, do you see any advantage for them in having this type of instrument? Well, because of those opposing polarities, depending on where you happen to be and whether the wires near that meter happen to be the same polarity or not, you may find that you turn something off and the electric field intensity increases or vice versa. So the predictability starts going out the window because you have to justify this counterintuitive relationship that if you turn something off, a field increases, or if you turn something on, the field apparently shrinks or decreases in intensity. It's not intuitive. Hmm. Okay. Let's go so to half. To, go ahead. So I, I get calls intermittently from consultants who say, I had this meter and this happened. Why is this happening? And, you know, for the life of me, because they haven't had the chance to open up a breaker panel and look inside, I'll have to explain to them the nuts and bolts of what they're supposed to know. Okay. Let's go to halftime. We'll be back. We're going to go into a little more detail with Sal LaDuca with the second half of our show. We're talking about investigating 
electricity and electromagnetic fields and indoor environmental quality and how it all comes together. We'll be back in 90 seconds. IAQ Radio would like to thank our association sponsors. The Indoor Air Quality Association, a nonprofit multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Visit them at iaqa.org. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, who use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them, wolfsense.com. IAQ marquee sponsors are. John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at iaq.net. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. All right, we're back for the second half of our interview. Let's move to the next slide, John. We got Sal Laduca. I want to, this one's titled Field Detection and Measurement. Um, it says you use the, the body voltage surrogate as shown below when time and resources are available, as this can be a bit time-consuming. Can you talk to listeners a little bit about what you're talking about there, Sal? With that, I am trying to identify which circuits provide how much influence in an area of interest. In that, let's say you have a typical home with, say, 30 breakers, 30 circuit breakers. Mm-hmm. Uh, many of them will serve other areas of the house and will go nowhere near the area of interest. And I would suggest that the area of interest should be the bedroom because that's where you spend the most time. Okay. Um, and so you may find that if you turn off all the breakers and then turn them on one at a time so that there's only one turned on, you can measure the influence in that bedroom and find that there's only two circuits involved. And if you need and you have the sensitivity, you can turn off those two circuits at night so that now you have an electrically quiet environment where you sleep. To put it in perspective, I went to see a client who had most of the breakers turned off in the home and they had their bed in a master bedroom on the floor thinking that they had made the room um, electrically quiet. With that non-contact voltage probe, I was able to determine that there was an electric field in the floor. And with that assembly that you have in that sketch on the PowerPoint, I was able to identify the course of that cable that was going past that bedroom. And it happened to go directly below the mattress, right dead center. The mattress, of course, as standard design, has a metallic spring base. So anything metallic within a field will take that field and echo it so that the bedroom and the mattress were electrified centrally by that cable directly underneath when in fact they were thinking that because they followed the labels on the breaker panel, they had made their bedroom electrically quiet. So you can never really rely on those labels. I've never seen them to be correct. And using this arrangement, we use a ground rod and a long wire to your meter, you can identify which circuits are involved going through that process. The meter can be any number of meters, and if you take a look, I use something like this, where I have a dongle that I attach, and I simply contact the metal, and that is part of the input. The other input would be the reference wire on this corner, um, you probably can't see because of the shading. And that will be the ground wire going outdoors. I hesitate to use the ground lug of an, on an outlet because there's a good chance that the wire may not be connected or it could be uh, miswired and that you could have 120 volts live on that ground lug. And so I hesitate very much to use that as a measuring reference. All right. Let's go to the next slide here, John. We're talking about um, the AC voltmeter. 
that you use can be any digital multimeter having a standard uh, impedance. That's so we're still talking about the same uh, the same topic here, right? So right, the digital multimeter can take on any shape. I use this one uh, partly because it's convenient and it has a jaw for measuring current. Uh, in addition to also being usable for measuring voltage and other things. But I could use a device as simple as this guy, which only may be costing $30 at a hardware store. But now if I want to measure current with this guy, the one that does not have the jaw, I have to get the separate current attachment to feed into the two holes on the bottom of the unit. Okay. So some meters are a combination, some meters are not. Let's go to the next slide, John. All right. So here we've got, um, I think we've, we've kind of talked a little bit about this earlier. Let's review, though, for the, the second measurement. The first measurement is uh, generally the, the voltmeter, I believe, you were using up here. The, yes. uh, and then the, the second, generally speaking, is going to be this Gauss meter. Talk to people yes. a little bit about that. Okay. The Gauss meter is designed to measure alternating magnetic fields. Those magnetic fields are different than the background magnetic field of the planet in that if I have such a meter and I were to turn it on and I were to place a magnet against it, it would not be able to see it until I start wiggling that magnet and now I'm gonna get a level reading on the meter because it sees a changing magnetic field. So yep. if I use this Gauss meter and I see a changing magnetic field, I'm gonna start thinking, hey, what is going on? And I'll start walking forward, backwards, left and right until I find what the problem is. In this case, it happens to be a simple fan to keep me cool. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a home, it could be a wiring issue. It could be an interconnection with a plumbing system. Um, it could be a power line outdoor. So using a Gauss meter like this, even though it may only take a few minutes, may involve walking across the house end to end, side to side, maybe walking outdoors to see where the pattern intensifies or decreases to get a three-dimensional mental picture of what the shape of the field is, which will tell you what the source is, which will tell you whether you can do something about it. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this is the, the Gauss master, Dr. Gauss, a uh, little different meter, but same general idea, Sal? Correct, that is this one, which is uh, the simplistic meter that you can get a hold of easily on the web, either Gauss master or Dr. Gauss, uh, two names for the same meter. This is an analog display where you can see a meter and you, you can see that there are variations on it. This is probably more intuitive in that you can see changes in the level much easier. Whereas with a digital display, you see levels that may change numbers and the changing of the numbers may make you think, okay, what is my meter doing? Is it going wacky or bananas? Uh, with the analog, you can see something that periodically changes like so many times a second or so many times a minute, and you can identify it or correlate it to a piece of equipment that is starting to go bad. This one, although inexpensive, becomes a concern or an issue because you need to know how to use it and that to get the proper reading, you have to properly align it until you get the highest reading, and then it is aligned properly with the field. With this one, there's no need of alignment in that it has three coils inside of it. And so no matter which way you turn it, it will always give you the same reading. What's the cost on that one? This one, which is a FW Bell 4080, is sometimes available on eBay for $70 to $100. This one, brand new, uh, around $40. Um, the FW Bell has a newer uh, descendant from it. Um, I think it's a 4180, and we're talking $400. Okay, about 400 bucks in for a new one. Let's go to the next slide there, John. 
I think we've already got it up. All right. Now, you've, you've shown us this one a few times, um, but now you're talking about verifying the measurement from either of the Gauss meters. Uh, you use this clamp-on current probe to identify the source. Yes. Well, as I said, in that one client where they had a problem with the HVAC unit, they noticed a correlation in that the field emerged all over the house whenever the HVAC unit was on. And so I'm thinking, okay, I can walk by the HVAC unit and I see a field there, but am I absolutely sure that this is the case? So using this meter, I can absolutely clamp on to the feed of the HVAC and clamping onto the feed, I can measure the current and determine whether that is actually the source of the magnetic field. So and it's two different should, tools verifying each other. What should the current be? Basically, nothing if I'm, I'm going through this right. Supply and return are supposed to be identical. So whether yeah. you're using 550 or 500 amps, as long as you check both supply and return simultaneously, the meter should always, always read zero. Okay. That's what I thought. Just checking. So, all right. Okay. Got to keep me on, keep me on my toes here, buddy. All right. Just let's get awake the and alert. <laughs> Good. <laughs> all right. It can also be used as the voltmeter for BV measurement, ohm meter to check materials conductivity for shielding and current to identify the source of magnetic field. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Uh, yes, I went to a home where we noticed a very unusual um, electric field in the um, home. And I sent you an email, I think five minutes before we started the show that shows a very rogue uh, waveform and lots of harmonics. And they were concerned about the radio frequency from the neighborhood and the various Wi-Fi routers in the neighborhood. And I said, well, we can talk about shielding. And they said, well, we have storm windows. They have aluminum screening. And I said, well, let's measure the aluminum screening to see if it actually is aluminum. So we took the meter, we connected leads, and we went to check the electrical resistance of the screening. And the screen was definitely plastic and not metallic. So therefore, being plastic, it was of no use for shielding. If it was metallic like aluminum, it would have provided a blocking area at the window interface. And, you know, before the show, we talked a little bit about this whole shielding idea, um, Sal. And you, you um, cautioned, I guess I would say, IEPs about the, that they need to be careful with respect to uh, – some of the sales um, tactics, let's say, of the people who sell these shielding uh, type uh, solutions. Can you, can you comment on that a little bit? Well, again, another client interaction. Um, a previous consultant uh, had a conversation with one of my present clients and said, you need to do shielding. Let's paint the walls and the ceiling with conductive paint. Well, depending on the type of wiring, that shielding needs to be grounded to prevent it from becoming energized or picking up voltage that it should not. Unfortunately, the source of grounding that they used was the electrical system. And it had electrical noise. So that they introduce a very ugly waveform onto a very large surface area, making the condition after worse than before. That's for shielding. Now, there are some people that sell gadgets that are supposed to clean your electricity or harmonize your environment electrically somehow. But in many cases, the conditions are also, again, worse after than they are before. And they do not necessarily provide the technical effect that they claim. And I've proven this before with several clients, and I'll prove it again if I have. All right, let's go to the next slide. We're going to talk more about detecting harmonics. Um, this is your third check. It's a simple one. Uh, it looks like you've just got a transistor radio there, Sal. So let's talk to people a little bit about that. I'm glad you like to listen to radio. <laughs> I tell some of my clients that they should become AM radio aficionados because Sorry. anything that uses power in a non-smooth fashion 
will produce electrical noise. Let's see. I don't know if you can hear this clearly. A little bit. Let's. Well, now we can hear it. This is my digital meter. The digits on the multimeter or the digits on the Gauss meter are strobed to save battery power. So even though the digital numbers look like they are constant, they are strobed faster than your eye can see the flicker, usually more than 30 times per second. So to you, the numbers look steady. To an AM radio, it will pick out that strobing and detect it as electrical noise. The AM radio portion is an inexpensive check of detecting the harmonics because if you can detect them, uh, it tells you that they are intense near the low end and they are um, enough high up in frequency to encroach onto the AM frequency band. Uh, I've had harmonic sources encroach onto the FM. There has been some that have encroached right into the radio frequency into the uh, 800 megahertz um, band and cause interference with those. So the AM radio is a very inexpensive way. And I went to see a client just past week and I walked in the home and as I went between stations, it was absolutely quiet. I could actually have clear reception of the stations and between them, silence. In some homes, there is noise, electrical noise, throughout the entire spectrum of that AM radio. And we're only talking about the AM frequencies. So we're, we're looking between stations. Is yes. That, okay. Yes. And then I'm going to, let's say after the show here, I want to play around a little bit with uh, my AM radio and try and detect any harmonics issues in my home. Okay. I will be Dial that radio station, get a, get a station first to see if I'm working right and getting reception, and then go between stations and just walk around the house and then listen for changes in the, in the sound? Yes, to get a clue of what you should be expecting, I would turn it on, go between stations to where it is possibly the most quiet, and turn the volume up to where you have a reasonably tolerable noise level and then approach certain devices like maybe the computer that I'm using or yeah. other devices and see what kind of noise you pick out from the electronics hmm. and realize that a computer is usually only a local source of that electrical noise. Now you can take that same AM radio and as you walk throughout the home you should not be able to detect that same kind of noise anywhere and that the home should be quiet as you approach the walls maybe near some wires within that wall you should be able to detect electrical noise depending on what you are using uh, at the time but in the middle of the living space by a couch on the bed the AM radio should be quiet between stations Love that. I love that one, Sal. I'm going to do that when we're done here today just to uh, give it a try. And then, okay, so I find, um, I find a bunch of noise by my bed. I guess I could then start playing with the different electronics, whatever they may be, my lamp, my, uh, my clock, uh, yes. and, and then try and figure out what's causing that increase in the harmonics if I got the technology. Te uh, if Technology the, correct. Yes, you do. If I've got the, the, the vocabulary correct, too. Yeah, uh, you do. And then I can try unplugging that or turning it on and off. I mean, is that the way you kind of use this? Well, you can do a very global check in that you can simply go to the panel and turn off all the breakers. And if the noise goes away, then it's most likely from electrical usage within your home. There is intermittent possibility that it could be coming from a power system where there's an insulator, insulator broken in your neighborhood, and that can cause broadband electrical noise. But generally, with an AM radio, you can pick out sources within your home, and you can identify them by either unplugging or turning off breakers. 
sometimes I go right to the breaker panel because even though the panel is covered in a metal cover, the breakers themselves have a plastic body and they are transparent to radio frequency noise. So I use the AM radio and I scroll slowly down the number of breakers as I turn them off to see if the electrical noise vanishes when I turn off breakers number three, seven, or 17. Oh. Uh, in the one home I visited a few weeks ago, out of maybe 20, there were only two breakers that were extremely noisy and everything else was quiet. And why and were they noisy? They were associated with lighting. So they had fluorescent and a variety of other nonlinear and non-smooth current users. And because lighting was used in the entire living space all the time, there was electrical noise in the living space all the time. I see. All right. Let's go to the next slide, John. We're going to run a little uh, tight on time here, but I think we'll make it. All right. So now we've got the uh, – to get a better definition of the harmonics, to go a little beyond our, our uh, AM radio, you, you'd have to use a power quality analyzer, which is a combination oscilloscope and spectrum analyzer in one unit, such as the one we're showing on the right. Can you talk to the listeners a little bit about the um, – when you would use this or when you would need this instrument? That would be used to identify, let's say, the currents that are being used in your panel and how they are used. That is, in essence, the big daddy to this guy, which can detect uh, a number of current, as in how many amps, uh, whether they're... Um, AC or DC, depending on how you hook it up uh, and voltage, but it doesn't give you the waveform. It does not give you the frequency spectrum. If you determine that there is electrical noise and you want to find out which they are producing uh, the noise, rather than turning the breakers off, you can use a power quality analyzer and clamp on each of the individual feeds out of the panel uh, or inside of the panel to determine which ones are noisiest in the way of having more harmonic content to them. So and you put right onto the cable. And there you can make a value judgment as to do I, do I want to pursue this or do I want to put this aside, just jot it down and go on to something bigger. Okay. You clamp it right onto the cable. Uh, yeah, you use it just like this other one. You clamp it right onto the cable to detect the current. Uh, on the bottom of the meter showing in the PowerPoint, there are two lug connectors, banana connectors. You would connect wires to that to measure the voltage. Generally, the voltage would not be affected as much. It would only be affected to maybe 2 or 3%, whereas the current can be as much as 20 to 40% distorted. And the basis of that in the, is that you should be able to turn everything on in your home um, whatever lights, fans, computers, or whatnot, and you should still be able to expect 120 volts within only a few percent the entire time. Whereas current, current may be very distorted the moment you turn something on. And this device will tell you how distorted that is and whether it's a concern. All right, let's go to the next slide. We're Coming up on uh, about four minutes left here, so we may go over five minutes, but um, hopefully that's okay with you, Sal. So. Okay. All right. To check the radio frequency background, the last check usually, uh, your, your last check usually, things get complicated quick. Can you talk to listeners a little bit about this uh, list of bullet points you have here? Uh, a majority of radio frequency presently uh, goes up to 2.5 gigahertz, including Wi-Fi, which includes Wi-Fi. However, some of the newer Wi-Fi routers are using 5.8 gigahertz. And so I have some clients who insist on wanting to know what content there is of the 5.8 gigahertz. Well, okay. I have instruments that read up to 3.7 gigahertz that includes your typical normal Wi-Fi, but you want me to spend more money just so you can see the 5.8 gigahertz. 
For that, you can use an application on your smartphone that will let you see the Wi-Fi at 2.5 and 5.8 gigahertz. And the application costs nothing. But when you look at radio frequency, you are concerned as to whether you're going to be close to the maximum permissible exposure recommendations or whether you are somewhere down in the cosmic background, as it were. Mm -hmm. You can be in a home in the middle of a metropolitan area, and depending on the type of walls and the type of windows, you're out in the woods. The radio frequency background is minimal. Or you can be out in the woods, and depending on your electronics, you have a metropolitan environment indoors. So when you look at this, the peak average is a measure of the highest that the radio frequency level reaches. And when you consider a Wi-Fi router, let's say that the peak value is 10, the average value may be one. If you have a whole bunch of routers and they're all operating in concert, the peak may still be 10, but now the average starts creeping up because you have more of those pulses. And so the average starts picking up and increasing in level. The range, again, whether you want to look at what is common or whether you want me to listen for cosmic background and oddball frequencies. Um, or do you want a meter with numbers? There's a meter that's interesting. I think they call it an acoustometer that has LEDs of varying color and it has a sound that comes out of it to try to give you an idea of what the device is that's producing that emission. And people go around with this, well, does it tell me legitimate numbers that I can take to the bank and make conscious, correct decisions about whether I need to do something or not? Okay. Uh, or do I need a meter that actually gives me numbers? Or do I need to see a spectrum of frequencies to see what all there is? And depending on the luxury of time and resources, I can go from a single number to extensive detail and and i'm assuming you don't find that's commonly necessary that is correct and in a general case it's a simple request I, I was reading your website and i'm concerned about emfs can you come measure my house okay fine maybe two hours i'm ready to buy a house can you check it before me before i sign on a dotted line or while i'm in the due diligence process after having signed and generally, that's an hour or less. Um, or I have a problem because I think it's connected to one of my pieces of equipment. Can you come verify and see what the problem could be? And so the request can be either very simple or very complex. And the level of detail just is, is complemented by the level of time that you actually have to devote to it. It's, it sounds like those are the most common types of requests that you get. Do you also occasionally get calls from someone saying, you know, my, my child can't sleep more than an hour. I, I remember on the first show we talked about that being a concern. Um, do, you, do you get many consumers that, that know enough about the potential issue anyway um, that would call you saying, hey, I've got this health-related issue with my, or sleeping or whatever it may be. Uh, I want you to come check things out. Well, when you think about this, you know, you look at the client and their needs and their requests, and you try to make real sense of it. I went to see a home where the husband was a, an MD. Uh, the wife was an entrepreneur. They had an office environment. They had wireless. They had Romex, which produced lots of electric fields. And they had two daughters. I think one of them was eight or nine, and the other one was just five. And this little girl would pull at your heartstrings because she would be doing somersaults in the grass, gorgeous little bit. Yet this little girl had a problem. She had incontinence issues every time she went to bed. Hmm. And they didn't tell me about this. What we ended up working with was the electric field content, how much of it there was in the bedrooms, how they could correct it by turning off various circuits. And when they did that, again, without invitation, uh, I was contacted, I was told, you know, we did the measurements of body voltage. 
We found these circuits that were producing most of the issues. We turned them off, and the daughters had a heck of a time getting adjusted. But after day three, the young little girl no more had any continence issues. Hmm. The MD's jaw just basically dropped like he's a medical doctor, a professional, supposed to know this hmm. kind of stuff. Didn't have a clue that the electrical was possibly a part of the issue. And when you see this kind of stuff happening, you think, well, yeah, that's wonderful. Well, it's anecdotal, coincidental. Well, let's get 100,000 people, maybe 10,000 of them died. Then we have a scientific study. I don't have time for that, and I don't think neither do you. Well, I like the way you say it. You know, that's possibly. I mean, it's anecdotal. We, we understand that. And, 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 you know, sometimes that's all we have to work with. And, you know, we do our best with what we have to work with. And to me, what, you, what you've been telling us over these two shows is common sense. It's, you know, yes, the wiring should be grounded properly. Yes, you should uh, be, be careful about using certain things like the dimmer switches we talked about and the uh, variable, freak, or variable speed um, blowers, on, on, which is becoming a big issue, Sal. It's one I, I know we didn't talk much about, but um, I think on the first show we talked about how the variable speed uh, blowers on your on your mechanical system can cause some issues with respect to electrical fields. And, and then, you know, people don't know what kind of wiring they have in their home and whether that, you know, I just remodeled an older home and then, you know, now I'm starting to think maybe I shouldn't have taken out some of that old wiring with the cable on it, you know, as opposed to putting in the new Romex. Uh, but, well, I try to be humble and realize that the few words that I say can have a lot of impact. Um, and so realizing that maybe 80 or 90% of North America is wired with Romex, I don't ever recommend ripping out the wiring because that's like rebuilding your home. But if yep. you have a major flooding issue and you have lots of walls soaked and you have to open it, well, by all means, try to get two birds with one stone and replace that wiring while the walls are open. Great and point. if you can save the day and improve somebody's life, Hey, that's more than you can take to the bank. And that'll make me feel, you know, cozy for the next few months because I did something right for that person. Absolutely. Let's get through these last couple of uh, slides here. So I think we can still do this, John. Let's go. Okay. Ahead. So we, we've got the, uh, the spectrum on the right here. I think you, you talked a little bit about this spectrum. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to mention on this? No, again, that will vary depending on whether I'm taking that in a field in the middle of nowhere, whether it's in a parking lot in a metropolitan area, or whether it's indoors in a building that has concrete block walls and the reception is basically minimal. Uh, I've been in buildings that there is no cellular reception. And so this uh, display that you have shown here would be shrunk in almost to non-existence. Uh, but that simply tells you what the various frequencies are. You can zoom in on any one of them and get a character of them to figure out how they are behaving, whether they're constant or intermittent. Uh, and, and again, that requires time. All right, let's go to the next one. And this is the last one we had on the field detection and measurement. Uh, you usually do not have the luxury of taking spectral measurements. So you typically simply measure the peak and or average over a range with an RF meter such as the one shown below. Talk, talk to listeners a little bit about this RF meter and, and how you use it. Okay, the meter that you have shown there uh, has a sphere with three uh, detector diodes in it that look at the XYZ direction so you do not have to turn it or twist it. Uh, if anything, you can hold it in front of you and twist yourself around the compass directions to try to see if the RF is directional using yourself as a, um, an energy blocker and that if the source is behind you, that will read a very low level. And if you turn around and the source is now in front of you, that will read a higher level. Uh, but that unit is a knockoff of an, uh, an x tech instrument, both of which are made in foreign countries so I take some issues with that. But even so, there are sufficient instruments to identify that there is a problem or there is not a problem. I walk into a home and I see a very strong field background 
and I start snooping around, is in that, is it directional, is it concentrated and focused in certain areas of the home, or is it localized in, in one spot, or is it everywhere? It, and, and with that, I sometimes make a measurement outdoors and a measurement indoors, just like air quality, to simply see if there's a difference. The structure and the constituents of that structure can make a major difference as to there being indoor intensity comparable to outdoors. And, and this meter goes from 50 megahertz to 3.7 gigahertz, which includes FM radio, every cellular service, uh, Wi-Fi, satellite emissions, so lots of stuff that can show up in there. What's Even the harmonics, if they are intense enough. What's the cost on this one? Uh, this one is no longer manufactured, but available at various sources for about 150 bucks. Okay. All right, let's get to the summary here, John. We've got a couple quick ones. Um, I don't know if we, we have time to cover this one or not, Sal. So maybe you could quickly summarize when you're talking about, you know, EMFs that travel at the speed of light and um, maybe kind of what you were trying to summarize. Here. Okay. Uh, EMFs in general do travel at the speed of light. And because we're talking about a world of different frequencies and 60 hertz would be 60 cycles per second, whereas 2.5 gigahertz for Wi-Fi would be 2.5 billion cycles per second. The wavelength of the one is about 3,000 miles. The wavelength of the other is about four inches. So depending on the wavelength, the interaction can be dramatically different. If you're within one wavelength, as in you're within reach of that cell phone at your head, you're in the near field. Whereas if you're walking in an airport and your cell phone is turned off, you're in the far field of all the various cell phones in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The interaction is different. Near field is more intense, more relevant, and that's where wavelength comes into play. All right. Let's go to the next one, John. Here's the wavelength. Uh, when wavelength is small, we're generally within the far field. I think this is kind of what you just talked about. Yes, exactly. Next one. Um, we did that. Let's go to the last one, I believe, harmonics. Uh, somewhere between near and far field and can occur in both. This is the one I think gets a little confusing, the harmonics. Let's, let's summarize this and uh, take it from there. So. Okay. Well, when you're looking at harmonics, you are looking at a um, frequency distribution of many frequencies that occur in real time. And so the frequencies near the lower end, the fewer cycles per second, will have the longest frequencies. The ones at the higher end of the frequency spectrum will have the shorter wavelengths. So depending on how many of these harmonics there are, how thoroughly saturated the range is that you're looking at will really put into perspective whether you're dealing with a far field, near field issue. But when you're looking at harmonics, you're really looking mostly at them riding on top of something else, like the harmonics riding on the magnetic field or the harmonics riding on the electric field. And since the electric and magnetic fields are typically power system related, you're always in their near field because you're talking about those two guys, the electric and magnetic, acting as a carriers for the harmonics. Hmm. Interesting. So, so I love talking to you about this. I, I, I hope we're going to do it again. I know we talked about maybe having a, a class up here at Indian Lake this summer and um, where we can actually get out and play with some of the instruments and show people how this is done. I just want to thank you for taking the time that you have to educate people and, and not ask for anything in return. I, I just think it's uh, fantastic what you're doing. You did a great presentation for us at uh, our Healthy Building Summit last year. I'm hoping we can get you back again this year. So I just want to thank you for all you do out there and uh, really appreciate having you join us today on IAQ Radio. I, I feel honored that you would have me on here, and I appreciate and uh, thank you for bringing me on. And I see that Cliff was being a little quiet this time, taking notes uh, very fast, I suppose. <laughs> very fast. Yeah, my arm hurts. Cliff, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Cliff, guys. 
Thank you, Sal. This is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to this week's guest, Sal LaDuca. Excellent stuff this week. Uh, also want to thank uh, at the controls, John, you've got to have faith, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. Most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. Please come back. We'll be back next Friday with another edition of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.